Okay, good afternoon, Graham. Um, would you mind introducing yourself? Yes, my name is Graham Atwell, and I work for a research company based in Wales, UK, called Pontodusky. Wonderful. Um, a couple of years ago, I had interviewed you about uh, emerging technology needs and, and leadership development, and I want to follow up on that thread, if that's okay. The first is, I wonder if you can describe a bit of, of what you see as the future of education in the next three to five years. Yes, yeah, I'm desperately scratching my head trying to remember what I said then. Um, I think I see contradictory trends. I'm afraid most of those trends are not over-optimistic about. Uh, but on the one hand, I see uh, cutbacks in education, privatisation of education, uh, in most countries, moves in that direction, uh, but also a rationing of education resources based not on any reckoning of need, but based on income. And so I see increasing amounts of people being denied access to what in the past has been seen as a comprehensive public education system. On the other hand, of course, I see an increasing move towards open education resources and increasingly powerful software allowing people to exchange ideas, to exchange knowledge, and to build their own education, if you like, without the need for that state. Uh, so I see the two moves going on. And a third point, because education doesn't exist in an island, which we sometimes tend to think it is, of course, all kinds of people getting, like publishers, mm -hmm. getting very concerned now at when we are sharing ideas mm -hmm. freely and we are not creating commodity value uh, as these people have expected in the past. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's fascinating you're pointing out the, the dichotomy of, of access here. On one hand, where institutions are shutting down, locking the doors, so to speak, to keep their contenting, to keep their value. On the other hand, you have this movement toward this openness and sharing. And um, where do you think the value will fall for the end user? How, how does that get sorted out? Well, the value for the end user ultimately is in their ability to gain an education, mm. but not just to gain a certification for three years or five years at school, but to gain an education which can last them a lifetime. It's a cliche. And to the extent with the speed of changes within our society today, learning is becoming embedded as a need for an ongoing thing, not just for work, not just for production, sure. but as part of the whole life cycle. Of who we are. Uh, and that's what we need to do. But I'm very aware that despite the fact we talk about the wonderful resources that are available online, people still need scaffolding, people still need assistance, people still need guidance. And I'm worried about where that's going to come from. So that's a perfect lead into my second question that has to do with the barriers. So if you um, can envision a three to five year model where students have more access, informal learning, uh, perhaps create their own degrees or design their own degrees, uh, what are the barriers to us reaching that kind of uh, educational system? The big barriers are the lack of support for students mm -hmm. in doing that and the fact that that support is rationed, mm -hmm. the fact that that support is actually constrained by a previous model, mm -hmm. if we can call it that, I call it industrial model mm -hmm. of education, rather than a model which recognizes the access to, mm -hmm. that rich access to resources and seeks to build on it. Mm -hmm. And the a certain traditionalism at the same time as privatization coming from governments in their approach. So on the one hand, they're trying to sell off the schools. On the other hand, they're promoting a very traditional curriculum mm -hmm. and a very traditional division of resources within the system, mm -hmm. rather than looking outwards to the possibilities of what could be. Right. And I think that that's what really what we need is what could be. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're saying sometimes we need to start dreaming mm -hmm. a little about what we could do and following that dream a little. I know we all tend to get defensive, we tend to get constrained by the funding availabilities, 
but I think it's almost uh, compulsory that we should be dreaming because we are the people who have taken upon us to investigate the potentials of this technology and I think we have to think of it as social potentials as well as the beauty of our code. Sure. So that's a perfect segue into the third question, which has to do with the leadership skills. And if I could just sort of play off on what you just said, I think you're encouraging um, leaders, both here and emerging, uh, to think more broadly and to think of the possibilities without some of the constraints. That's the dreaming part you're talking about. I'm thinking about them being bold. Yeah. Mm. I'm thinking about them being bold. I also think we have the cliche of thinking outside the box, but I think that let's constrain that to thinking outside the institution. Mm. And I think a lot of the potential is there in communities. I've become done some work with, in a small town called Pontypridd in Wales, mm. where we've started. We started out trying to use technologies within primary schools. We were very short of resources, so we started roping the community mm. into helping us with that effort. But then we started looking, how can we embed learning throughout our community? Mm. And we realized very fast that it's not just one initiative you need, or two initiatives, or initiative in the primary schools, or something in a community organization, but you need a community-wide approach, yeah. systemic to learning in the community. Mm. So where I'd say to leaders is stop thinking just within. I know you've got to fund your own organization. Yeah. I know all the problems you've got. But try and think hard about the whole community around you. Yes, the dispersed community through the internet, mm. but think about the physical community mm -hmm. and think not just what you can give to that community, yeah. but what that community can provide for you, the yeah. richness of experience. As a resource. As a resource. Yeah. Start yeah, thinking brilliant. about that community mm -hmm. as a rich, untapped resource. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's many, many people who would be prepared to contribute mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, from university degrees mm -hmm. to talking to kids in primary sure. school, and we're not yet tapping that as a resource, yeah. and we have the technologies which mm -hmm. help us do that. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, where I would be going mm. uh, uh, as leaders today. So we have uh, boundaries of titles and positions and boxes and, as you say, funding mechanisms and organizational structures, and and that inhibits us from un unta untapped resources. We're, we're not thinking very creatively about how to pull all of the, the parts and uh, constituent groups into a system. We're not thinking about that at all, and I think we have to, I mean, I'm very struck by Dave Cormier's reasomatic mm -hmm. uh, curricula, but I think it needs more reasomatic type linking between organic ways, between different parts mm -hmm. of our communities. A and it probably requires resilience, it mm -hmm. probably requires solidarity. Mm -hmm. I think those two words are very important mm -hmm. in the economic and social age mm -hmm. in, in which we're living. And that's the uh, the bold, and I would probably say the courageous trait that we need to embody. Yeah, but that's the only way we'll reach yeah. my dream of the future. Yeah. The, and the other scenario I gave you at the mm -hmm. beginning is not one which attracts me. Yeah, right, right, very good. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for asking uh -huh. me good questions. <laughs>